Well, greetings from Cooperstown, New York. It's a beautiful spring day here at uh, the home of baseball. We're glad you could join us for the latest in our series of virtual Voices of the Game programs. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Hall of Fame's Education Department. And today it'll be my pleasure to talk to former Major League standout Steve Sachs. Steve will be coming to Cooperstown this weekend for the May 28th Hall of Fame Classic Game. We're certainly looking forward to that. Steve Sachs, Rookie of the Year, five-time All-Star, and also a 1988 World Championship member of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Steve, we welcome you to the program. Thanks for being with us. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, Bruce. I'm looking forward to uh, this weekend. Anytime I get a chance to go to the Hall of Fame, it's a, an absolute special treat. So I'm looking forward to this. As I mentioned before, this is your third Hall of Fame classic. I'm trying to remember, uh, I believe you came up for a Hall of Fame game. I think you might have been playing with the Yankees at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, and that was uh, that was great to play in that field, and I was uh, kind of surprised how quaint it was. I, you know, if I can find a, a better way of describing it, but it, it was a it was a great time to be there, and the it feels like you know it feels like you're going back in time, uh, and it really brings um, kind of a sobering thought to you know uh, what baseball was like back then, how much the great the game has really uh, advanced itself, and you know, it's just a, it's just an amazing thing to uh, to go into that little town and see where it all started. It's pretty cool. Steve uh, played quite a long time throughout much of the 80s and the early 1990s. Uh, now working as a broadcaster, has his own podcast. You can see it on the screen here. Uh, Sacks in the Morning uh, focuses on three different areas, sports, money, and life. And uh, we'll have Steve talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the program as well. In terms of what's coming up this weekend, Hall of Fame Classic is this Saturday, May 28th, at Double Day Field. Game time at 1 o'clock. We still have some tickets available. And if you'd like to get tickets, the number is 1-888-325-0470. Again, that's 888-325-0470. You can also visit our website, baseballhall.org. And right there is the feature story. It's the headlining story is all about the classic. Click onto that and there's more information about getting uh, tickets. Now, Steve, this will be your third time around playing in the classic, which is essentially a kind of a legends game, an old timers game. I know that some former players are reluctant to take part in legends games for a variety of reasons. Obviously, though, you're not one of them. You enjoy this. Tell, tell us what it is about the Classic that you really like. Well, I like going back and seeing, you know, the players I played with and against and guys that, you know, I haven't even met before. Like, there's going to be some guys here this time that I'm going to meet for the first time, which I enjoy doing. Um, so I like that a lot. I'm not, I'm not too worried about the, the physical part of it. Um, I try to stay in shape. Um, I hope I don't pull a hamstring, which I don't think I will. Um, but... Uh, I, I, so I still like to do that type of thing. Um, and for me, it's just, a, it's just kind of like a, a, a snapshot where you can go back in time a little bit and get a little bit of that old feeling, just have fun with it. There's no pressure on you. You're not expected to go out there and, you know, hit a couple of home runs. So there's really no pressure on you. To me, it's, it's just the sheer enjoyment of the game and to go make a, a bunch of new relationships, more friendships. And, and I just love the, uh, the atmosphere of being there. You mentioned that you know you, you keep yourself in good condition. You don't look a heck of a lot different from when you played. Uh, maybe put a few pounds on, as I think we all do. I'm in my late 50s. You're in your early 60s. But you look like you're in excellent uh, condition. You could probably play nine if they asked you, right? Yeah, yeah right. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I, I, I like to take pride in working out. I, I try to stay in good shape. I'm actually, in some, in some forms, I'm in better shape now than when I played because I, I get to... I get to work out like I want in baseball. You don't get to do that. I was a, I was a speed player. And so my weight was about 100, 180, 185 pounds. And I had to lead off and be more of a, I had more of a sinewy type of a, of a physique where I had to be a speed guy. And now today I can do, you know, more lifting like I want. I weigh a lot more than I used to, but you know, I, I try to stay in good shape and, and I actually feel really, really good. At this age, I can do all the things I used to do. I can run and 
sprint and lift and do all the things I used to do. So I think it's just a matter of consistency. And I think that's the key is not overdoing it, but just doing it consistently, doing it a lot. It's not about being great once in a while. It's just about being pretty good every day. That's the key. Yeah. yeah. Of course, you were a second baseman. I imagine you'll be playing some second base this Saturday. Sometimes, though, in these legends type games, just because of the other personnel, you might be asked to play a different position, maybe third base, maybe the outfield. You're OK with that? Oh, yeah, I, I like doing that. As a matter of fact, I think the last time I was here, I got to play left field, too. I played a little left field when I was in, in, the, in the big leagues at the end of my career. I like doing that. I like to play the different positions. And um, so hopefully I'll get to move around a little bit and uh, and see what that's like. One thing we would advise you not to do, a few years ago, uh, we had Bill Spaceman Lee uh, playing in the game, and he volunteered to catch. Of course, he went behind the plate without any protective equipment, which was a little bit strange. Might well, be better that you don't do that. I understand how strange, but when you talk about Bill Lee doing it, it kind of makes sense, I guess. Yeah. So he went behind home plate with no equipment on yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to remember. I think he had just a mitt. He had no face mask, no oh. chest protector, no shin guards. Oh my God. He was kind of taking a 19th century approach before yeah. all of that equipment had come in. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I tip my cap to to Bill. Uh, he gets the, uh, you know, he, he gets the Macho Award. I guess <laughs> you can put that one out there for him. But yeah, no, I value my teeth too much, Bruce. I think I'm gonna just kind of stick with the the normal protective game plan that they have today that's what i'm gonna yeah. do good way good way to approach it let's talk steve about your career it started in the major leagues august of 1981 uh that's when you received the call to la uh, davy lopes the established second baseman uh, goes on the disabled list you're called up eventually you would replace lopes as the full-time second baseman Lopes was really, though, a legendary figure. He was part of that infield with Garvey and Russell and Say for so many years. Looking back, how tough was that, replacing a player like Lopes? Well, he was such a, you know, a great player. Um, and he was really helpful for me making the transition. He was really a professional to me. Uh, really looked up to him. And uh, I can remember in spring training when I was uh, probably – 20, uh, 19 years old and watching him come into Dodger town. I was taking pictures of him, uh, you know, getting out of his car and I was sending the pick, getting them developed back then. You had to get your pictures developed. And then I would send the pictures back home. And I really looked up to him a lot. And he was uh, really helpful. I mean, he knew that the writing was on the wall that I was eventually going to take his job, but, uh, or be his replacement, but he was great about it. He really helped me out. He showed me a lot about stealing bases and, uh, he was really a, a professional person, and I, I really appreciated that about Davey. The following year, 1982, that's your first full season in the major leagues. You did extremely well. You win Rookie of the Year, batting 282 with 49 steals. Every athlete has a level of confidence coming in, and certainly you're called up from the minors. You expect that you're, you're going to do well. You, you want to be optimistic. But as you look back, how well you played right off the bat, right from the start, did it surprise you that uh, there was not a more difficult transition for you? Well, I wouldn't say it wasn't difficult. I mean, uh, I thank you for your kind words. Uh, but, you know, it was, uh, you know, when you're playing against that level and those players are the best in the world. And so it, it, it to me, was very challenging, of course. Um, and I was, I was thankful for you know, the, the way I played and the team had really supported me a tremendous amount. And, and so I think it just all fell into the right spot. Now in that year of that rookie season, there was a lot of really good players. There was Ryan Sandberg and Steve Pedrosian, of course, Johnny Ray, uh, Bill Lasky. There was a, there was a lot of really good players that year. So I was, I felt fortunate to win the award that year. Um, and contemporaneously over in the other league, Cal Ripken was winning the American League Rookie of the Year award. So there was a lot of talent throughout the American and National Leagues that year of 1982. Um, but I think being on a veteran-based team, these guys knew how to win. That was a big reason, a big help for me, why I was able to make that transition. Your shortstop partner, was it still Bill Russell at that point? Yeah, Billy Russell was there in 82. Um, and then in 83, I believe he was out. But... Uh, 
that's that's another guy you know bill russell dusty baker steve garvey you know those guys were really really helpful in a plane and russell of course is a guy who's been around for what 17 years and so it's kind of like i had my own tutor on the field with me there so it was a nice thing yeah well here's a guy who was a tutor in a sense you played under tommy lasorda for all eight of your seasons in la tell us about your relationship with tommy well I had a great relationship with Tommy Lasorda. He was almost like a father figure for me. Um, <clears throat> my dad passed away early in my career in 1983. And, um, you know, Tommy was the person that told me I lost my dad. He, um, he was also the guy that, that stuck by me when I had that throwing issue for a couple of months in 83 and never took me out of the lineup one time. He said, after my career was over, he said, if I would have taken you out of the lineup, it would have crushed your confidence and you may never have come back from that. And he was right. Um, only one game in all that time did it, did it affect the team when I went through that issue it was mostly the, the errors I was making were inconsequential. They were, you know, they didn't cost the team only but one time. Um, but Tommy was great about it. He tried to make fun of it, try to make light of it. Um, and he never took me out of the lineup for one inning. And that to me was immeasurable. Uh, you know, it's inestimable what he did for my career when I went through the challenges I went through. Obviously you like Tommy, but Tommy, from what I've, I've heard, you know, he had this persona that we would see in public in front of the camera off camera, though, he could also be very tough on players, very demanding on players. Talk a little bit about that side of Tommy. Yeah. Uh, he was very demanding and, uh, you know, my dad was the same way and, you know, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't look down at that at all. I mean, I, I kind of welcomed the challenge and for me, it worked. Um, you know, the people that you care the most about, you expect a lot out of them a lot because you care a lot about them. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Tommy was very much a, um, he told it like it was. And if you, he, his style was not for the faint of heart. And, uh, you know, he was also a guy that, you know, would shake your hand and kiss you on the cheek and say, hey, this argument that we had now is over. Yeah. And I never saw him rip anybody in the press. Never, ever did I see him do that. If he had something to tell you that wasn't good, he'd bring you in his office and you'd have it out. And I had, and I had with him. And, um, you know, a couple of times pretty heated, one time very heated. Um, and when he wouldn't let you leave his office until it was over. You made up and then you came in and had, had some dinner with him. That's what he was like. And he, he, he was he was really a, a, a very unique manager and one that I really enjoyed playing for. So he called you into the office or you kind of went into the office because you didn't feel that it had been resolved? No, no. He called me in the office and um, I forgot what it was about. Something going on in the field. I wasn't playing well. And I, I felt that um, that maybe he was on me because he didn't think I was trying hard. And I really took offense to that. Yeah. But he knew me. He knew that I was trying. He was trying, <laughs> trying to get under my skin a little bit. And, you know, we were nose to nose on it. And then we got through that. And um, <laughs> by the time I left, we were giving a hug and shaking hands and making jokes again. So, I mean, that's the way he was. That's why I enjoyed playing for him. Is he? Yeah. And he treated everybody, that, you know, he, he didn't treat everybody the same because that's what managers do. Leaders leaders know how to treat people different because not the rules are the same for everybody, but people aren't the same. You get, you got to kind of know their personality. Yeah. It sounds like he wanted you to fight back a little bit. It's a good point. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and he, he, it's kind of like when, when I was teammates with Kirk Gibson, you know, Kirk Gibson was a very gruff kind of, you know, maybe a little cantankerous uh, attitude sometimes. And he didn't like it when people shied away from him or took it from him. I was his locker mate. I had a locker right next to him, and I gave it right back to him. I would, I would, I would instigate it on him sometimes and kind of call him out, and, and he liked that. And that's why we were such good friends, and um, it worked out great. You know, Steve, I remember the incident when Gibson first joined the Dodgers, and it was in spring training. And somebody had put, I think it was um, lamp black, which you normally would put over your eyes to cut down on the glare. Jesse he Orozco. put it in his cap. I don't know who it was. And he Jesse didn't speak all that well. 
It was Jesse Orozco. Really? Yeah. And he put he put that in his cap, and he Bruce he put the hat on, and then when he took his hat off, people were laughing at him, and he took offense to that because he he wasn't coming over there for jokes. Yeah. He was coming over there from day one to win. He made that speech in the locker room after this hat incident. Basically, told anybody if you come near my locker, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill you. Um, and I thought, oh, I like this guy, you know. And so he brought a different element to the team, which was very much welcome. And when Gibby started laughing and having fun, that showed a whole new side of him and just ingratiated himself with the team. We mm. before the season was over, Gibby was Gibby was a, a, a big one of the one of the most. Uh, affable I, I guess you could say guys in the clubhouse yeah so we kind of rubbed off on him and he rubbed off on us and made it a nice mixture i'd always uh, wondered who perpetrated that crime and now i know jesse orosco we had to, we had to actually bruce we had to actually tie uh, tie gibby up and tell him who did it <laughs> because he was wow. gonna kill jesse yeah, yeah that was pretty funny great stuff yeah. You stay with the Dodgers through the 1988 season. In fact, your, your last game with the team was in the World Series that year. Uh, then you become a free agent. You end up signing with the Yankees. Um, I'm a Yankee fan. I was a fan at that time. I was really just starting my professional career. And I, I was excited when you joined the team. I'm sure you were excited as well. But you also face another challenge. You have to replace another iconic player in Willie Randolph. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I didn't want to leave the Dodgers, but the negotiations broke down pretty quickly, and I, I went and signed with the Yankees, and it turned out to be a good deal for both teams because I went over there and was an all-star my first year and my third year there with the Yankees, and Willie Randolph was an all-star in the National League with the Dodgers. So yeah. to, to me, the business decision from the Dodgers and the Yankees, it, it worked out for both teams. So for me, it was a, it was a good thing. And, you know, I always admired Willie Randolph. I love his game. And, and so, you know, he went over and did it for the Dodgers and I came over and did it for the Yankees. And so it was a, it's a good thing. I love playing for the Yankees, Bruce. It was, it was, a, it was a different kind of a atmosphere for sure. Um, I actually felt more pressure playing in LA than I did with the Yankees. A really? lot less pressure in LA and in, in Yankees uh, with the Yankees. Um, and, you know, it was, um, it was the proximity of the fans to the field was really interesting to me because in LA they were, they were way far away. They're not so much now, but in, in Yankee stadium, they were a lot closer and that was kind of a neat thing to have that relationship. But, but I'll tell you what, my, my time in LA, I wouldn't have traded for anything. The, the fans in LA were so good to me. They were great. I love the LA fans. I, I put them through hell for a little while. Um, and they stuck with me. They know I was trying hard and, and I still have a lot of good relationships with, with uh, the people that are still work in Dodger Stadium. Yeah. I mean, the fans, every time I go back to, to Los Angeles, are always so kind to me. And I'll, I'll never take for granted how nice the L.A. fans were to me. I love the, love the people down in Southern Cal. You mentioned that first year with the Yankees, and you played extremely well. You batted 315, even though you had not seen many of those pitchers in a new league. Of course, there was no interleague play back then. You made the all-star team. You also played for another demanding manager in Dallas Green. What did no you problem. think of Dallas? No problem at all. No problems with Mr. Green. We had a great relationship. Um, and I went in there to do my job. And he was the manager. I respected his authority. And I went in there and I just busted my tail every day. Here's one thing I, th I found out, Bruce, about, uh, about the fans in, in the Bronx. is When, when I signed over there... I believe it was of that contract or the next one I signed with the Yankees. I was the highest paid guy at my position. And I knew that if I went in there and I busted my tail, no matter what kind of money I was making, if I went in there and busted my tail, that the hardworking people of the Bronx that went to the games a lot, they would, they would respect the effort. And I was right because yeah. I, I got a great relationship with the fans in New York because I think they, they respected my effort. I mean, too many times they see guys out there that are not running balls out, that are making a lot of money, and they boo them. But it doesn't matter what kind of money you're making. If you bust your tail every day, I think they're going to respect that. And that's, that's what I did. Well, that was no question. That was a characteristic of your game. You were known for your hustle, your speed, all-out effort all the time. And 
Uh, that certainly occurred during those three years in New York as well. One of your coaches uh, was under Dallas Green in 1989 was Frank Howard. And I know we talked about this a few years ago when we opened up our Shoebox Treasures baseball card exhibit. We had you on a panel in the Grandstand Theater. And I asked you about this card and about Frank Howard, but I love this card. I love Hondo as well. And I know that you have a great story about Hondo and your relationship with him. I have many stories about my relationship with Frank Howard. Uh, I can't tell you how much I respect Frank Howard. I love Frank Howard, love the man. And I don't say that very lightly because he was just such a genuine, caring, helpful person. I, I, I've never had a better coach. Uh, and boy, he just kept things simple. He was a brilliant hitting instructor. And um, I owe a lot to Frank. He was a big influence in my career, a big help in my hitting, kept things very simple and worked his tail off. I never had to you know, prod him to come and throw me extra batting practice. He was happy to do it. And, and um, I, I owe a lot to my success because of Frank Howard, because of his, his, his spirit, his, his big heart, and his baseball acumen was off the chart. And just the wonderful nature of this man. He's just a gentle giant. And I love being around him. I got a chance to talk to him a couple of months ago. And mm -hmm. I hope I can see him soon because I really, really love the guy. How's he doing? He, he's doing fine. He seemed to be doing fine, slowing down a little bit. Now, this is a big man that's probably close to 80 years old. Um, but Frank was a, a, a big, big man physically uh, and personally, and just the, the kindest person you'd ever meet in your life. Just they don't make him better. Yeah. He was really an early version of Aaron Judge, um, not as athletic, not as good a defensive player, but right. similar size, six foot seven six foot eight, hit with tremendous power. Uh, his game really took off when Ted Williams became his manager in Washington and helped him develop uh, patience at the plate. And I know that was, that was one thing that Frank always emphasized, you know, working the count, getting a good pitch to hit. That was, that was always a message from him. Yes, Bruce, exactly. And when you mentioned getting a good pitch to hit, I have a picture in my house here, I'm looking at it now, of Ted Williams and myself having a conversation in spring training. And the one thing I took away from Ted Williams, he says, I'll tell you, I'll give you a piece of advice right now. Um, and you can take this with you for the rest of your career. The most important thing he felt in hitting was getting a good pitch to hit. He said, when you get that good pitch to hit, don't miss it. And that's, that's the essence of hitting. And I never forgot that. And your relationship, as you mentioned, Frank's relationship with him, you mentioned that as well, getting a good pitch to hit. Yeah. It's not happenstance that it all seems to be that Ted Williams, the people that rubbed off on him or that he rubbed off on, talk about getting a good pitch to hit. That's where it's at. You said you met Ted in uh, in spring training. You were able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Oh, yeah. And wow. I, I, I cherish it to this day. And I, I have a couple pictures of it right now. I'm looking at um, just a – it. Uh, you couldn't quantify what that meant to – talk to the greatest hitter that ever lived. I mean, I was, it's, it's like when you go up to him, you almost want to genuflect, you know, <laughs> because this is, you, you are, you are in front of a, a baseball God. You really are. Speaking of great players, great hitters, uh, you were a teammate for three years with this man, Don Mattingly. He was really the linchpin of those teams in the late eighties into the early nineties. Uh, his last year was 1995 when the Yankees were really starting to turn things around as a franchise. Talk about Don Mattingly as a teammate. Um, one of the best teammates I ever had. Um, uh, immeasurable work ethic. Uh, fantastic person. Just a uh, top of top notch guy. I can remember one uh, instance, if I may share it with you. Sure. Uh, in my first year in New York. Um, I went down to the batting cage underneath the stadium. And this is a very, very hot, scorching hot day, in, you know, maybe the first or second day of October. And Frank Howard was down to throwing, uh, throwing batting practice at 10 in the morning for a one o'clock game, last day of the season. Didn't mean anything. We were 12 games out. Don Mattingly had a big year already. This game didn't mean anything. He shouldn't even have played. And I go down there and I'm just going to get loose a little bit. And I see Don Mattingly in the cage. Comes out with bleeding, uh, bleeding blisters, working his tail off, sweating like the Dickens. 
And it was the last day of the season, didn't mean anything. And we were out by 12 games. We were out two weeks ago. And that's what he's doing, working in the cage on the last day of the season for a game that didn't. The, the, the reason why, Bruce, is his work ethic, not only in what he was doing on that day, but his whole life, his work ethic and his determination dictated the circumstances in which he lived. It's not the other way around where some people feel my circumstances are dire and I now live in these circumstances because of what I was dealt. Not Don Mattingly. His work ethic and his, the, way he, the way he reacted to situations that are put to him, the way that he was a, um, a leader who led from the front, not from the back. Mm -hmm. That's what dictated his circumstances in which he lived because of his actions, his determination, him down there working on the last day of the season that didn't mean a squat, but he didn't know any different. That's all he knew. That's the only thing he knew how to do. And, and I just admire the hell out of that. Steve, did you see him becoming a manager? Did that, did oh, that, yeah. that development did not surprise you? Not at all. No, no, no. Uh, listen, if you don't like Don Mattingly, let me put it simply for you. If you don't like Don Mattingly, there's probably something wrong with you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because he's, he's cut out of the same cloth as Frank Howard. Those two guys are come out, cut out of the same cloth, okay? That's what he's like. And that's the one thing I love about baseball is I've met some of the greatest people that God made, uh, nicest human beings in the world. And this man's one of them. I want to talk about one more of your teammates. It came later on. You're traded to the Chicago White Sox, but you have a chance to play with a very young Frank Thomas. Yeah. Well, Frank Thomas was one of the best hitters I've ever seen. When you talk about the culmination of power, of being able to hit the ball the other way, knowledge of the strike zone, on-base percentage, and hitting for, hitting for you know, a respectable, a very, very admirable 300 plus average, you combine that with the power he had. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he knew the strike zone as well as anybody. I mean, you have some guys that can go off the strike zone and whatnot, so you've kind of pad numbers or whatever. Frank Thomas didn't have to do that. He, he knew the strike zone down to the inch all the way around it. And he was a very, very disciplined hitter um, and technically sound. And boy, I mean, his size, his, his power was just crazy. The kind of power that Frank, Frank Thomas had. And so one of the best hitters I've ever seen. You know, when I first saw him, he, he didn't look like a baseball player. He was, he was so big, so muscular. And you thought, yeah, this guy's going to be a little bit awkward on the field, but that didn't really happen. Uh, that was not a problem for him. Oh no, and I think I think his his uh, his his what he had done in football as being a big tight end at Auburn, um, I think that really helped him on the baseball field as well. They say if you're well rounded and play different sports, uh, yeah. it's probably a pretty good thing for you. I think Frank Thomas really um, exemplified that tremendously. The fact that he was a really good football player and then he was able to come and take you know, those talents and how nimble he was and whatnot, being a tight end over to play first base and, and be one of the best hitters in baseball. Steve, let's talk a little bit about your post-playing days. You did coach briefly with the Diamondbacks. You joined their staff in 2013. That was when Kirk Gibson, your former teammate, was the manager. You also got to meet our current Hall of Fame president, uh, Josh Rawich, who was an executive with Arizona at the time. You only coached for one year, uh, decided it wasn't a long-term thing, but tell us about the experience. What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? I, I liked it. Um, I liked being on the field and, and uh, you know, kind of doing it in a different uh, respect. You know, there wasn't the pressure on me as a player, like a, a player had. Um, I really loved being around the players and all that. I, I just wasn't really in for, uh, you know, a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff of putting in, you know, 14 hours at the, at the, you know, a lot of it was dead time for me. Um, I felt that being a first base coach was cool, but especially because I didn't have to go to the minor leagues and do it. Um, but I, I needed something more challenging. If I had something higher up in the organization and it would only be fair for them to take somebody else that had been through the minor leagues and done it. So I couldn't ask for something like that. But uh, after, after being the year there of just a first base coach, I, I felt like I wasn't being challenged enough. And, you know, I, I didn't want to come back and do that again. 
I, I would have to do something more uh, up the chain there. Uh, and so that was it for me. It was only one year, but um, I liked it. It was fun and it was good to be back on the field, but I needed something more demanding in, in baseball. And I, I really, to be honest with you, Bruce, I, I really didn't want to go down into the minor leagues and try to cultivate that for five or six years just to come up and, and possibly do something different in baseball. I, I didn't want to make that commitment. Yeah. Also, by this time, you're a little bit older. I'm wondering about the travel. Do you feel the travel more as you as you do get a little bit older? Not really. Tra travel that never bothered me it was always part of the deal. Uh, you know, as long as you get your rest. I was always somebody that got my rest. I, I took care of myself. I wasn't really out late at night. And um, I was somebody that, uh, you know, got their rest. And that's a really important thing. So the travel to me was almost inconsequential. It was just part of the deal. And I didn't feel really that much of it physically when I was when I was a coach either. It was, it was just more um, the fact that, I, I, you know, to go back into the minor leagues and try to cultivate something to get higher up in the organization. I didn't want to do that. Yeah. Well, it's understandable. Yeah. Um, you've been broadcasting now for a number of years. You've done some work for uh, MLB Network in the past. Uh, today, you have your own uh, podcast, which we want to talk about uh, briefly. And we also want to uh, uh, talk about your work as a color analyst on uh, some Sacramento AAA games as well. Right. Uh, but tell us about the podcast. It's not just sports. It's not just about baseball. Really looks at a lot of different things. Yes. The podcast is called Sacks in the Morning. And um, as I said before, some people snicker when they hear that. Why is that Sacks in the Morning? You know, well, that is my last name. And the podcast is about uh, motivation because I'm a speaker as well. I do motivational speaking all over the country. Uh, and um, I speak for Corporate America. And uh, so my podcast is an offshoot of that. And so on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we have three to five minutes of motivational nutrition in the morning for somebody that's getting ready for work on, on their drive to work as they're walking in, they can just listen to the podcast and I got three to five minutes of motivation for them. And then on Thursday, every other Thursday, so we skip, skip one, every other Thursday, we have a long form guest where we talk to somebody uh, that goes along with the byline of the podcast, which is called sports money in life. And we have anybody in those, uh, in those fields, to talk with us and give us some interesting facts, interesting things that happen in their lives. So we have, we have, uh, you know, people in the acting field. We have musicians. We have people that talk a lot about uh, money, like cryptocurrency people. And the Lifeline, of course, gives us the ability to talk about just talk with just about anybody. So we got a really good team here in Sacramento. I work with, and um, I love the podcast. It's become a passion of mine. I spent nine years with MLB Network. Uh, in, in the radio, in the radio booth doing that. Um, so I've got a full life and I, I love what I'm doing. The podcast is a real passion of mine and um, I love broadcasting. It's just a lot of fun for me. Who are some of the actors and musicians you've had on? Well, we've, we've had Al Jean, who is the uh, executive producer of The Simpsons, uh, for instance, in the acting field. He was uh, yeah. uh, a guy that put together the Simpson episode in which I was on in my uh, second year with the Yankees and that is still one of the most highly watched um, uh, Simpsons episodes uh, to date it's called Homer at Bat yeah. and I was on, on there with eight of my contemporaries uh, at the time uh, playing baseball with, like with Ozzie Smith and uh, Wade Boggs and Mike Sosha and Roger Clemens and Strawberry and all these guys it was a lot of fun to do that episode so um, we have people in that industry that are coming on later as well uh, we've had uh, Mike Kowalski, who was the 39 years drummer of, of the Beach Boys, um, mm. who is a friend of mine in the music field. And um, we, we've got a lot of people lined up coming up this summer that I'm not going to mention yet. I want people to sign up and go and listen to the people, that, the array of people that we have coming up this summer. It's going to be great. So we have people in all those different fields. We have people yeah. from Sarsen Funds who uh, was a sponsor of us for a while that uh, is the number one cryptocurrency uh, company in the United States. They're an awesome uh, bunch of people that come on and, and give us their take on the crypto industry as well. So lots of interesting stuff on the podcast. Now, are you the solo host or do you have a co-host with you? No, I'm, I'm a solo. I'm a solo host. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to go video as well, maybe next year um, after we get our feet uh, on the ground. We're, we've been in less than a year now. We've got great listenership and um, things taken off really well. So I'm hoping 
Um, next year we'll go video as well. So we'll, we'll be on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then every other Thursday. And then we're going to go video next year. Now, for those who want to find the podcast, should they just Google Sacks in the Morning or is there another way to do it? Uh, anywhere you get your podcast, you know, Spotify, Apple, doesn't matter. You can go there and just type in Sacks in the Morning and just register. Of course, it's free and uh, they can, you know, go on there and listen whenever they wish. Everything's archived as well. So they can go back and listen to some of our older shows, which we get a lot of listeners that do that. Very good. And of course, the Hall of Fame Classic coming up this Saturday, May 28th, 1 p.m. at Historic Doubleday Field. Steve Sachs will be among the players participating. Now, Steve is not going to be the oldest player, although he's one of the few players from the 1980s participating. But Steve Swisher, Nick Swisher's oh. father, just recently said he's going to be coming out. Steve is 70, and wow. I don't know if he's going to play. Maybe not, but at least he's going to be on the active roster. Oh, I'm playing, though. Am I the second sure. oldest guy? I think you're the second oldest after Swish. <sighs> yeah. Okay. All right. I don't care. But I'll you're going to play. I'm playing, of course. Okay. I'm playing all nine. Will you do the home run derby, too, or is that – If they uh, ask me to, if they ask me to, I'll okay. do whatever we want. Just point and click, Bruce. I'll all right. Just point and click. Very good. Well, Steve, listen, we really appreciate your time. We look forward to seeing you in Cooperstown this weekend uh, for the Classic. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to uh, run into each other and say hi this weekend uh, live and in person. But we appreciate you taking the time out to talk about the Classic and about your terrific career as well. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate time with you. I'll see you this weekend.